Well, good afternoon. Uh, I'm here today to tell you a story. And it's uh, one that you probably uh, are well aware of if you had a TV about five years ago. In fact, uh, very shortly, in just uh, uh, three days or four days, on Wednesday, is going to be the five-year anniversary of uh, Sully and my uh, landing this aircraft in the Hudson River uh, back in uh, January 15th of uh, 2009. But I'm going to tell you a little bit different kind of story because uh, obviously I was there. I'm going to tell you this story by, uh, by putting you in the jump seat. And you might ask yourself, you know, what's a jump seat? Uh, but uh, between the uh, captain and the first officer in every airline cockpit, there's a little seat that folds out from the wall. And uh, it's a very special place. And only very special people get to sit there uh, because you have to be on the uh, a database with the Department of Homeland Security to be allowed access to a cockpit, uh, airline cockpit, in this country. Uh, but today I'm going to put you on that jump seat. I'm going to do that by bringing you along with me and telling you my story. And as you sit there, on your left you're looking at uh, Captain Chesley Burnett Sullenberger III. That's, uh, that's quite a name. You know, in the course of the trip, before we had this accident, uh, I was looking at uh, Sully's name. We have what we call trip sheets. We're little pieces of paper. It says where we're going, when we have to be there. Basically a flight schedule, and it has all the uh, passenger or the uh, crew members' names on it. And of course, I'm looking at this name that's taken up the entire space that's allotted for a name on the trip sheet. And I said, uh, Sully, that uh, name like that must uh, put a lot of pressure on a man to produce a, Ches uh, a uh, Chesley Burnett Sullenberger the fourth. And he said, Jeff, he says, that's exactly why I adopted two girls. <laughs> now, Sully grew up in uh, Denton, Texas, uh, learned how to fly as a teenager, and I uh, got a private pilot license when he was in high school. I uh, was fortunate enough to get an appointment to the uh, Air Force Academy. And uh, after graduation, uh, he did very well there. He was top in his class, and he uh, was uh, uh, able to pick where he wanted to go, and he wanted to fly fighters. So he was uh, trained and uh, became an F-4 Phantom fighter pilot just after the, the Vietnam War. Uh, when he got out of uh, his hitch in the Air Force, he joined uh, Pacific Southwest Airlines, which many of you might remember from out here in California. And that's one of the airlines that later, about 20, uh, 25 years ago, merged in to become what is the present day U.S. Airways. Uh, Sully is a, uh, is a real professional among professionals, and that was recognized by the fact that he was actually a, a check pilot, a training pilot for quite a while in the uh, 1990s on, uh, on McDonnell Douglas uh, MD-80s. To your right is me, Jeff Skiles. I also uh, learned how to fly as a teenager. Uh, I went the civilian route. I taught, uh, I was a flight instructor. I taught people how to fly while I was going through college. Uh, and graduated, worked for a couple smaller airlines, and I've been working for uh, U.S. Airways since 1986. I've been both a captain and a first officer at uh, U.S. Airways over the years. At the time, I was flying as a first officer because I also had a construction business, and uh, as, uh, as uh, flying as a first officer, right seat as we call it, I could basically pick my schedule and run my business, whereas a captain, I would be uh, uh, completely captive to uh, the seniority system. Now, I, I find that people like to uh, tell me where they were when they first saw the pictures or, or heard the news of this incident. And I don't know where you were, but I'm going to tell you where I was. We started out our, our uh, flying that day in uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania on a layover. Flew down to Charlotte, switched airplanes, and uh, we're sitting in Charlotte, North Carolina at the end of the runway waiting for our takeoff to uh, LaGuardia. Now there was low clouds and snow in the LaGuardia area that day and if you know anything about uh, the East Coast or New York City that means air traffic control delay. So we were sitting at the end of the runway with our engine shut down in the holding pad uh, waiting out about a 45 minute or an hour uh, air traffic control delay. I'm asking Sully you know, while, while we're there, I'm kind of quizzing Sully because this is a brand new airplane for me. I just got out of training literally the Friday before, and this is my first line trip on an Airbus. 
And the airplanes I'd flown hadn't really gone west to Kansas City in, uh, in the last 20 years of my career. So I'm asking Sully what there is to do on the west coast. Uh, because places like going to San Diego or here, you know, Los Angeles area, these are exotic layover destinations to me. I'm, I'm used to uh, Binghamton, New York, and, uh, and uh, you know, Charleston, South Carolina. Well, ironically, he starts telling me about uh, Seattle. And he says, uh, you got to get the red eye so you got the time, but you can walk from our hotel to this place called Kenmore Air at the Lake Union Seaplane Base. And they fly these float planes out to the uh, San Juan Islands, up to uh, Vancouver, British Columbia. And uh, they'll let you jump seat along on them. And, and I'm thinking, this is really cool. I got out the back of my trip sheet. I'm writing down who to call, you know, what the phone number is to set this all up, because I, I've never landed on water before. <laughs> and, and at the time, I was thinking this was going to be really cool. We, uh, we obviously flew up to LaGuardia, and by the time we got there, the uh, cold front had moved through, pushed all the clouds and snow off to, the, uh, off to the east. And it was clearing skies, but it was cold because of the cold front. I remember walking around the airplane, which we do after, uh, before every takeoff, we walk around the airplane just to check the outside condition. And I remember how bitterly cold the, the weather was. We boarded our passengers, about 150 passengers, in fact it was, 150 passengers joined us. Every seat was full in the airplane as we pushed back to go back to Charlotte, North Carolina. Now for, for us, this was the last leg of a four-day trip. And when we got to Charlotte, we were going home. Sully lives in Danville, California. Uh, I live in uh, Madison, Wisconsin, and our flight attendants lived in Pittsburgh and in Winston uh, and in Asheville. And uh, not only was this my first flight, you know, line flight on the, uh, the Airbus, it was also my first flight with Sully. Uh, a lot of people think that we're joined as the, at the hip as a crew, but we aren't at all. At uh, US Airways alone, we have 5,000 pilots. So it's normal for me to sit down next to somebody that I've never met before and have to act as a crew from the very first moment that, uh, that we work together. And we do that by having very rigid procedures that we follow through and very strict training uh, to teach us those. And uh, that's how we can act as a crew, even though we don't know the people that we work with. As we taxi out to the runway, Sully taxis the airplane, because the steering tiller is over on the captain's side. And I set the controls for takeoff. I input our weights into our computer system so we get the proper speeds for our takeoff talk on the radio, and actually run checklists as we go out. Holding short at the end of the, the, the runway, I give the takeoff briefing, because it's actually going to be my leg to fly. Uh, normally, uh, as you go through a flight, you swap legs. One pilot flies one leg, one pilot flies the next leg. Just happened to be my leg to, to fly back to Charlotte. We're cleared for takeoff. Sully taxis it out, lines us up with the centerline stripes sets the parking brake, and he says, your aircraft. And I said, my aircraft. And we, we always used exactly those words to transfer control of the airplane to make sure that somebody's flying the airplane at all times. Uh, and actually, that is because it's a, it's a result, it's a procedure that's a result, it's a result of the fact that there have been accidents because nobody was flying the airplane. Uh, both pilots might have been trying to solve an emergency, and nobody was paying attention to what was going on with the aircraft. We're clear for takeoff. I reach over, I grab these uh, two big thrust levers that are sit between us and push them up into the takeoff and go around detent. And we start to accelerate down the runway. Now, um, the Airbus is a fly-by-wire airplane. Now what that means is that there's absolutely nothing in that cockpit that is actually attached to anything. There's no cables running to the control surfaces or you know, control, cable controls to the engines. When I move these big throttles, I'm actually operating these little micro switches that are underneath the panel that, that send electrical impulses to the engine to say to speed up to this certain speed. Uh, when we use our controls, our side stick controlling, our controller, it's just, it's just uh, sending signals to a computer, which then 
transports hydraulic fluid out to servos on the, on the, uh, the ailerons and the elevators and the rudders to operate them. It's just like RC flying, except we're on the inside. We roll in down the runway. Sully makes our standard call outs of 80, V1, rotate. I pull back on the side stick, we leave the runway. He says positive rate, I say gear up. And then I roll to a heading of north, which was our assigned takeoff, uh, takeoff heading. We're cleaning up the airplane and accelerating. And about 3,000 feet in the air, uh, which isn't very high, uh, we're about over what, uh, what is Harlem. Um, I, something that kind of catches my eye. And I, I, I look up uh, kind of higher than us and slightly to our right, and I see a line of birds. And they're just too close to maneuver around. Uh, you have to have, you have to, it's almost, by the time you spot a bird, it's really almost too, too, dip, too close to really do anything to maneuver around it. And then I hear Sully next to me say, birds. And then that fast, we were on top of them. Our bodies were ricocheting off the wings, uh, off the fuselage, around the nose. And we think two of them went through the core of each engine. I remember the shock of it felt like having a bad cold. And, and I remember thinking, we have to, we have to assess you know, what the damage is. And then just that fast, about a split second later, we lost all power on both engines. They make this high whining sound at climb power settings. And they just, you could hear them just reduce to nothing. We're, we have the airplane with our nose up in the air. With our, we're at our minimum airspeed. And we've just wiped all the power off the aircraft. The speed tape is just unwinding ahead of us. I'm pushing the nose over to try to keep the airplane flying. And Sully decides to take over flying the aircraft himself at this point, which is his prerogative, because he's the captain on this flight. And he says, my aircraft. And I said, hey, your aircraft. <laughs> but this is, actually, this is actually a signal. As airline pilots go through a normal day, you're constantly cross-checking each other, uh, making sure that every input is, is, is confirmed with the other person to make sure that you don't make mistakes by using two sets of eyes and two brains on everything that you do uh, that might be of critical importance. But when we have emergency situations, we have to split roles. One person flies the airplane uh, and handles the air traffic controller. The other one tries to troubleshoot the problem. And I knew when he said, my aircraft, your aircraft, that was all I need to know to put me on a different path. We transfer control, and I reach for my quick reference handbook, they call it which is a 177-page book of emergency procedures and data that we have, but it's ready to hand so we can grab it. And very quickly, I find the, the proper checklist, which is the dual engine failure checklist, uh, which is what we use as an emergency procedure to try to restart the engines. But it's really designed to be used at 30,000 feet, not at 3,000 feet in three minutes' time. The, the checklist is three pages long. I never got more than a page and a half in it in the time that we were in the air. It was just a scenario that really wasn't designed for and we really didn't have anything for. Um, Sully's got the airplane in a glide and uh, he initially had to push the nose way down to, uh, to get our speed back and then he's flying what we call green dot, which is a little speed indication on our, on our instruments. I'm trying to actually make sure we have hydraulic power, electrical power, and actually trying to restart the engines. I hear Sully talking to our air traffic controller about going back to uh, LaGuardia, but it's over on the left side of the airplane, and I can't really see it from where I am on the right-hand side of the airplane. Sully didn't think that we could make it. Our only options were to go back to LaGuardia where we took off from, or to go to Teterboro, which is an airport over in New Jersey off of our right, you know, or the Hudson River. Otherwise, all we're looking at are, are skyscrapers, roads, houses. Uh, it's New York City. There's, uh, the only other open area would be Central Park. And of course, Central Park is full of people and trees and, and rocks, if you've ever been in there. Uh, while, you know, while we knew what was going on up in the cockpit, back in the cabin, Obviously, they had no idea 
uh, what was happening. Our flight attendants sit right behind the wall, facing backwards. They don't even have a window to look out of. And they, they've heard you know, the, the birds impact the airplane. They've heard the engines die. But they have no concept of, of what's happening up front. We didn't have the, the opportunity to tell them. Now back in the, the, the passengers back in the cabin um, have heard the birds, and some of them even saw the birds hitting the airplane. There's a fire shooting about 50 feet out the uh, back of the left engine. But still, most of them thought that, that that engine obviously has a fire, but would be returning to land on the engine on our right. In fact, what happened was we uh, had got two birds through the core of each engine. And when you, you're uh, looking at an airliner from the terminal, you look at the, the big engine, you're looking at what they call the fan section. And it's uh, what they call spools. And the spools will have a lot of different blades on them. There's usually two spools of fan blades. And then behind it, if you were standing up against the engine looking right into it, there's a much smaller turbine compressor section. On these engines, it's another 17 disks of these, uh, of these uh, 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 spools with the spinning blades on them. And you can actually take a bird through the fan section. You might have vibration, but the engine will still be usable. But we were unfortunate enough to take these large birds through the core of each engine. And on our right engine, it just shattered the first spool of the compressor section, and all that metal went back through the engine and just destroyed it. The left one was actually doing a little better. It was running at what would be idle power, uh, just like your car idling. Uh, but the birds had managed to knock the fuel nozzles out of the burner cans, and gas was injecting around the engine and igniting in the slipstream, which is why there was fire shooting out the left side of, uh, left side of the airplane. But the importance for us was that it was running a um, generator for a while for us for electrical power, and it was running a hydraulic pump so that we had controls all the way down to the, uh, to the water. Now when we hit the, hit the runway and Sully took over control of the airplane, he also you know, instantly uh, started our auxiliary power unit, which is a little jet engine in the tail. And it runs a generator, and, uh, which was very fortunate because in, even in that three and a half minutes as we were descending to the river, we lost the gener one generator we had left. But by that time, the uh, little engine had come up to speed, and it took over the electrical power. And he also turned on our igniters, which are essentially that's exactly what they sound. It's like a, a gas grill. You know how you turn on the gas, you hit the igniter, and it starts. And these are igniters in the engines. And you could hear them in the background going boom, 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 all the way down to the river as they were continuously on trying to restart these engines. Sully is, uh, if, you know, I'm sure you've all seen Sully on TV. And he looks like... Uh, and he looks like a professional, and he's even more so in person. Uh, he's, a, he's the kind of guy who comes to work every day and tries to do, does the very best, and tries to do even more than the very best. That's just the way, that's just the way Sully is. Uh, he's, he's, he's certainly in the, the top notch of pilots and the, the upper crust of airline pilots. Our controller's pointing out Teterboro Airport off to our right. And I remember pausing what I was doing as I was running through my checklist trying to restart the engines and looking out at it briefly. And then I could see it start to rise in our windshield, which every pilot knows means you're not going to be able to reach it. And with that, really our only choice became the Hudson River. Um, but, you know, the, that really wasn't so bad. It was broad, it's flat. And at the moment that we were descending towards the river, there was actually a space to land. It's actually a very heavily trafficked area with ferry boats and, and, and river commerce uh, going up and down. Uh, a lot of New Yorkers are really surprised that we could find a place to land the airplane in the river because of all the traffic that goes, that goes up there, up and down there. But uh, in, on that day, we had one moment of bad luck and a thousand moments of good luck because, you know, the river ahead of us happened to be clear. What I remember most about that uh, descent to the river was, was all the, the noise in the cockpit. We have uh, all kinds of uh, oral warnings 
that uh, warn us of various things. And um, many of them were going off at the same time. We were getting an audible voice because of the fact our engine was, our engines were shut down and we were so low to the ground, it was calling an uh, audible voice calling out too low gear, too low flap. Um, we're having a, uh, getting what we call a ground proximity warning system alert, a whoop whoop pull up call out. We flew too close to an airplane that was, or a helicopter actually, it was flying up the Hudson River at low level. And we have devices that warn us of that. And it's calling out traffic, traffic. And we have an alert bell that's uh, every time there's a failure, and it can be a small failure, the alert bell will sound ding, 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 ding. And this was going off continuously every time we'd silence it because it would get new failures uh, as we were descending down to the river. Through all this noise, you know, Sully had the presence of mind to reach back and to grab the uh, public address telephone, which looks just like an old telephone receiver. And it's between the two of us on the console, uh, at the back of the console. And he picks it up, and it's uh, our PA, and he gives the, the command to the flight attendants and the passengers. This is the captain. Brace for impact. Now this is actually standard terminology. And it's a signal to the flight attendants. Just like your aircraft, my aircraft, set me on a different path to try to troubleshoot the problem, this is a signal to our flight attendants to start preparing the passengers for an emergency landing. They started chanting, brace, brace, heads down, stay down, brace, brace, heads down, stay down, over and over and over again to get the passengers into the proper position uh, you know, for, for a crash landing. You know, with that, the passengers know that they're not going to be returning to land at a gate. Some of them wrote notes to uh, leave in their shirt pockets. Uh, a large number of them took out their phones and texted loved ones on the phones that were supposed to be shut down when they left the gate. Uh, one of our pastors showed me his showed me his message. He still had it two years later on his phone. Uh, and it said, plane's going down. I'll always love you. Say goodbye to the kids. Uh, one passenger who I'm actually going to be meeting up with here in three days as part of our reunion, he's one of the guys who's planning it, uh, he had two days of bad luck. Just the day before, his uh, wife had been diagnosed with breast cancer. And uh, fortunately, she's completely uh, recovered. But uh, he's a spiritual man, and he made himself a pact with God. And of course he said, God, if you have to take somebody, well, please take me. So here it is, less than 24 hours later. He's plummeting to the earth in this engineless airplane. Doesn't have any idea what the next few moments of his life will hold. And he told me all he could think about was, God, I know we made this pact and all, but did it really have to be so soon? Back up in the cockpit, we're not able to get any kind of a rotation out of these engines. They're just not going to restart. About a thousand feet in the air, we knew that we were going to have to ditch the airplane in the Hudson River. So I started calling out airspeeds and altitudes to give Sully situational awareness. Now he has to land with the wings perfectly flat so that he doesn't dig a wingtip and potentially cartwheel the airplane. Uh, one of the things that uh, going through a circumstance like this uh, gives you the opportunity to do, if you want to call it that, is to listen to your own crash on the cockpit voice recorder. Uh, the cockpit voice recorder is a very closely held um, device. Uh, you've probably heard the air traffic controller tape. That was being dispersed almost instantly after the accident. Um, and you heard Sully talking to the air traffic controller. The cockpit voice recorder is very closely held. Uh, only about five people on the National Transportation Safety Board, they're the people who investigate airline accidents in this country. Only about five, there's five people who are on the cockpit voice recorder committee. They're the only ones who ever get to actually hear the cockpit voice recorder. We were invited down, Sully and I, because after they did an in-depth study of it, 
they couldn't understand some things. Um, they said, we obviously communicated because of our actions, but they never could hear us saying anything to each other. And they wanted us to come down and listen to the, the tape and help us with the, help them with the investigation. Well, you know, frankly, we didn't really, we couldn't really help them. And I don't really have any other explanation other than that while I was doing what I was doing, my tasks, uh, I was completely aware of everything around me. I knew what Sully was doing, I knew what he was thinking, and he knew the exact same thing of me. And it's, uh, I really have no other explanation for it than that. But as we were listening to this tape, um, we both heard something that we didn't recall at all from that day. Right before, before we touched down in the river, Sully says, uh, so you got any other ideas? I said, actually, no. We, we hit hard uh, on, on the tail, but then the water just seemed to come cascading onto the windshield. It, it, it seemed like the airplane was going right for the bottom of the river, but then it just popped up and it was bobbing in the waves, just like you see in that picture there. I turned to Sully and I said, well, that wasn't so bad. <laughs> but Sully has to get up and command the evacuation. The flight attendants are waiting for two words, evacuate, evacuate, so that they can start into their pre-trained procedures. But uh, we had lost all electrical power. We didn't even have battery power for some reason. So he has to go back and verbally command the evacuation. I stayed behind in the uh, cockpit because we even have an emergency procedure for something like this. It's called emergency evacuation checklist. It's right at the front cover of my quick reference handbook. First item on it is parking brake set. <laughs> Second item is engines number one and two off. Well, one of them isn't even attached to the airplane anymore. It's heading down to the bottom of the river. And the other one, you know, was, wasn't even running when we actually touched down. I go through this and it didn't take me long, really. None of it was really applicable and uh, went back and about 45 seconds later or so, went back into the cabin. And uh, I'm, I remember I was kind of shocked because I'm standing there in that little aisle between the cockpit and the cabin. Uh, the rafts are already deployed, probably the first 10 rows of passengers are already off the airplane. And uh, there's a guy running up the aisle towards me wearing nothing but boxer shorts and a pair of sweat socks. Now it's January. It's 20 degrees out. And I'm pretty sure he didn't get on the airplane that way. I talked to him later, and it was his idea that he was going to swim to shore. So, of course, like in the movies, he takes his pants and his shirt, sweatshirt off and all that. And, of course, he instantly realizes it's freezing. And he stops before me, and he's shivering, and he says, what do I do? And I said, go get in the raft. And I told the next three people to go sit on them to keep them warm. The passengers got off either onto the wings or into the rafts in the front. But we couldn't use the rafts in the back of the airplane because of the way the airplane was sitting in the water. Uh, there had been some damage to the back and the tail had filled up with water. So a um, number of the passengers had no option but to go out onto the wings and, and stand in that freezing cold water. Uh, initially, uh, they were standing on top of the wing, but even as they were still out there, the airplane sank into the water, and actually it started to rotate a little bit, and at one point the people on the very end of the right wing were actually waist deep, still standing in this water that was literally freezing temperatures. The river froze over two days later, so it was at freezing temperatures. Passengers got off and, and were outside the airplane, and, and, and we really, uh, we, we uh, realized that none of them have any flotation devices. Um, the airplane, every seat has a life vest, but it, they hang in little pouches underneath the seat, and you'd have to pay attention to the boarding card when you got on to know that. And of course, people got up and, you know, in their haste, just left those behind. So Sully and I went back to about mid-cabin, where those, uh, the emergency exit rows are, and we're getting life vests and seat cushions to pass out to the people on the wings. 
And where we were there, the uh, water was about up to, up to our knees already. And the airplane was sinking lower in the water. And it was, I can't, it was just freezing cold to be in that ice water. Uh, it, just, it just felt like it just, you know, your bones just ached. Both Sully and I started walking on, up on the seats in the armrests and just climbing over the seats. Uh, just to keep our legs out of the water, but you still had to reach down into that ice water with your hands to get those life vests that are that are hanging below below the seats. After some period of time, we cleared out the whole area of seat cushions and life vests, and uh, suddenly looks at me and says, "Let's get out of here." So we went back forward and went out through the normal door that you board through, um, you know, as you as you're getting onto an airplane. Now, you know, when we were back there in the cabin, it was just us. We didn't know what was going on outside the airplane. And I remember kind of being struck by the fact that it was, it was real calm in the airplane. And then when you walked out through that door, there's just, just pandemonium going on out on the river. We were completely surrounded by boats already. Uh, the, we had come to rest right in mid-channel where the ferry boats cross from New Jersey to uh, New York. And they were actually on shore about ready to cast off their ropes and make their transition across. So they just came right to the boat and they were there within minutes. Um, there was a, a helicopter overhead that was dropping a, a police frogman into the water to help the passengers who were slipping off the wings, you know, to help them get back on. And there were fire boats that were already there. And, and this helicopter was kicking up spray and it was just drenching everybody. So we got into the, 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 the forward uh, slide raft, they call it, and it was uh, designed for about 40 people and it had about 70 in it. So it was just absolutely packed in there. I became um, uh, really just obsessed with the fact that this raft is tied to the airplane. And the airplane could sink any time and take our raft out from underneath us. Now, they think about this because somewhere in this raft there's actually a safety knife that you can cut that rope with. But there were so many people in the raft there was no way that I was going to be able to ask people to move around or find this knife. So I called the Sully who was a little further back and I said we need a knife and he called up to one of the crewmen on a boat that was really right over the top of us and he pulls out this knife, throws it down to Sully, they pass it forward to me and you know it's a clasp knife and I hit the little button and the blade pops out like that. It's, just, it's like a New Jersey switchblade. So I cut the rope and we start drifting away from the airplane and I'm holding the rope, or holding the knife in my hand in an inflatable raft. And I'm realizing this probably isn't the best thing to do with the knife at that moment, but you know, it's a nice knife. You wanna give the guy his knife back. You, and, but after a while I realized this is just too, just too dangerous, I threw it, threw it in the river. We floated around the, uh, the nose of the airplane and went further downstream. There's actually quite a current in the Hudson River as it's going out. Uh, we actually landed about 42nd Street and the airplane was way out about two miles downstream uh, by the Statue of Liberty before they finally managed to lasso it and drag it to Battery Park where it sank overnight. But we floated around the nose of the airplane, and uh, one of the passenger ferries, the, uh, the Athena, comes beside us, reverses its engines, comes to a stop right next to our raft. And of course, we're sitting down here on the ground, and the deck of this thing is you know, up about six, eight feet in the air. And I'm thinking, this is just another obstacle. How are we going to get up there? And then a, a crewman runs out, and he throws his boarding net over the side. And then he throws a rope over at me, which I have to hold the raft next to the boat. And I couldn't even grasp it with my hands anymore. They were so frozen. I remember I held it in my elbow and just sort of sat on the raft leaning up against the side of the boat in absolute misery because of the cold. The passengers started to scamper up the, uh, the, the, the boarding net. And some period of time passed that I, I don't really remember because we had a lot of passengers in the airplane and my recollection is the first one started up and then I hear Sully behind me saying, Jeff, 
we better still get out of here or get out of here while we still can. And I remember being surprised that I looked behind and the raft was empty, except for Sully and I. So we climbed up as best we could and got onto the deck. Mostly it was by one of the crewmen grabbing me by my belt and depositing me, you know, in a pile on the deck. Got up and I walked into the heated cabin area, uh, of course, where all the passengers were. And I walked through the door and there's one of the passengers there and he's got one of those flip phones and he just flipped it shut. And he looks at me and he offers me the phone. And of course, my phone's back in the airplane. So I thought, well, maybe I should call somebody. Well, who should I call? I thought, I'll call my wife. Let her know I won't be home tonight. So I kind of dialed the number with my knuckle. It took me about three tries to get it right. I got the phone up to my ear. Planes uh, floating by out the windows. Passengers are still on the wings at this point. And she says, hi. And I said, hi, this is Jeff. I don't think I'm going to be home tonight. And she says, why? And I don't, I don't know, you know, I was, I was a little crazy at that moment. Um, I felt like I had to get off the phone as rapidly as possible. And I said, well, we took off from LaGuardia, we hit birds, we flamed out both engines, we had to ditch the airplane in the Hudson River, we think we got everybody out okay, I gotta go. And I hung up. And as I was hanging up, I hear this eek. And she said she was running to the TV and it was already live on TV by that point. So then Sully tries calling home, but he's got caller ID. And his wife's talking to a friend of hers on the phone. So it beeps and she looks at it and she says, oh, it's just Sully. He'll call back later if it's important. So then he tries calling our dispatcher. We have dispatchers in the airline business, uh, just like you know, truckers have dispatchers. So he calls our dispatcher to let them know, you know where we left their airplane. <laughs> and this guy, you know, to his credit, answers the phone. And he says, I don't have time to talk to you right now. We have an airplane down in the Hudson. <laughs> now, the whole incident took place only about, or where we landed was only about uh, 300 yards, 200 yards or so off the, uh, the western shore of Manhattan. In fact, for those of you who have ever been to the USS Intrepid uh, Museum, uh, it's an aircraft carrier that's tied up uh, on uh, 42nd Street there. We were kind of right off the fantail of the, uh, the boat is where we wind, finally landed. So it didn't take us long at all to get to the ferry terminal and file off uh, you know, into the, the warmth of the, of the ferry terminal with, where most of the passengers that, uh, of the airplane were and others were, there were a few that were taken to some other terminals. The entire flight took five and a half minutes. Uh, two minutes to ta from takeoff until we hit the geese, three and a half minutes from when we lost our engines to landing in the Hudson River. It's taken me about five times that long just to tell you about it. We were at the ferry dock uh, long enough for the politicians to arrive. <laughs> Mayor Bloomberg and Governor Patterson came down to the site to hold a press conference. And of course, Sully and I thought we were the only ones that could possibly have known what happened. But this is where uh, Governor Patterson named the incident the miracle on the Hudson. But you know, within my own industry, it wasn't considered to be a miracle at all. Uh, what it was considered to be was a validation of what we've done in the last 20 years to really create a crew concept, to create the procedures that allow crews to work together in very perilous circumstances and to create a, a, a safety environment which is far, far safer, safer than it was even, even 20 years ago. Um, 20 years ago, we wouldn't have had any of the tools that we worked with that, that could allow us, Sully and I, to interact as a, as a team. Uh, we really worked as, as individuals uh, rather than working together in the cockpit. And, and that the, safety, of the, or the, the uh, safety record of the aviation industry, I think, speaks to that. Uh, of the major airlines, which long ago adopted what we call crew resource management, um, there, even when I started in this industry, there used to be uh, accidents 
maybe once a year. My own airline, U.S. Airways, had five fatal accidents in five years in the late 80s, early 90s. There hasn't been a fatal a fatality on a uh, major airline in the United, a United States major airline since 2001. That's over 12 years of perfect safety in the airline industry because of the kind of uh, procedures that Sully and I use, we were very fortunate to have the support of, uh, of a whole system that is put in place by our airline but with, uh, with training, uh, with procedures, with, with support uh, that, that allowed us to work together and, and really be the beneficiaries of that on that day. Now, um, at the ferry terminals, you might imagine, we didn't, nobody knew what to do. There was, uh, the, initially they thought this was a terrorist incident. And all the police forces, the even federal FBI, DEA, uh, Manhattan uh, police, uh, Port Authority police, there were, there were probably more uh, individual police officers in the ferry terminal than there were passengers and crew on that night. And nobody knew what to do with us. Do we just let them all go? Well, eight passengers took it upon themselves to do just that. They got off the boat walked out to the curb, hailed a cab, went back out to LaGuardia, and they were on the 650 flight to Charlotte <laughs> without their bags. The rest of us really didn't know what to do. Uh, but after about an hour and a half, the door opens and a man comes walking in who I had never seen before, but he's wearing a U.S. Airways uniform. And uh, I'm thinking, thank God, there's somebody here who knows what to do. Well, he was actually a, uh, uh, a pilot rep for our uh, LaGuardia base, which we had at the time. And he found out where, where we were. He lived in Manhattan, put on his uniform, came down so he could get through the, the police barricades, and came in, and he introduces himself, and he moves off about three feet, pulls out his cell phone, calls up somebody, and he says, I got him, I got him. What do I do? And uh, he, was, he was talking to our, our accident investigation chairman. He says, take him to a hospital. He said, well, they're not hurt, because we weren't. We were completely uninjured. We were wet, cold, but we were uninjured. And, and he said, take him to a hospital. It's a place of sanctuary. If you don't have a home that you can go to where you can get behind a closed door, you're in a public place, an air, uh, air, a uh, hospital emergency room is a, a safe place that you can go that has restricted access um, so that people can't get in there, like the press can't get in there. So it's a standard procedure. Take them to a hospital emergency room until we can figure out what to do next. So that's what we did. Went to the, went to the hospital and we we're there for a couple hours. And then now it's about 10 o'clock at night. This happened at 3.30 in the afternoon. Uh, we were transferred to a, to a hotel back, actually, ironically, right across the road from LaGuardia where we started all this, you know, about eight hours before. When I get to the hotel, the first thing they, we do is we sit down with our, uh, what we call our critical incident response team. Uh, we're very fortunate in, uh, as airline pilots to have the support that we do because we have a pilots association and they have, tr they have a large number of people who are trained to react to emergencies like this, to accidents, and they have various roles. There's people who are trained uh, by the National Transportation Safety Board, and they act as investigators and go out, you know, and find the work in the in the field, you know, picking up the pieces of an accident. Um, we have people who are trained in psychological issues to help. In this case, us survivors and or our families um, get past you know, the, the, the tragedy that's happened. Uh, we have media people to help us deal with the media. And by that evening, uh, 45 of my fellow U.S. Airways pilots had just dropped whatever they had, got a bag, and got to New York City as any way that they could. The accident investigation guys were there for two weeks before they finally ever went home after that accident. And the first people we see in the hotel are these critical incident response people that are supposed to help us with the psychological issues. Now remember, they, they sit Sully and I down, and Sully and I are sitting next to each other on a bed in a hotel, and the guy's sitting on the bed on the other side, and, uh, and he says, you probably don't realize it right now, but you're suffering from post-traumatic shock. 
You probably won't sleep tonight. You probably won't sleep tomorrow night. Maybe on the third night you'll fall asleep because you're so exhausted and then you'll wake up after an hour and the whole thing will be running through your head like a freight train. And, and he was right. I think I uh, probably only slept maybe 10 hours in the first week after the accident. I lost 20 pounds right away. Um, but they're there to tell you that this is normal and that it will go away over time. And if it doesn't, you should seek professional help. And then he tells me, okay, go back to your room and relax. <laughs> relax? I just crashed an airplane. I mean, I'm, you're not supposed to do that. I'm an airline pilot. And I, you know, we knew, Sully and I knew that everything that we are would be brought into question. Everything we think about ourselves and what we are is going to be very publicly examined and, and, and questioned. There was no relaxing. I couldn't turn on the TV because it was all about the accident. I, I didn't have anything but the clothes on my back. There was nothing to read. I went outside, I just left the room and I went out and I walked all night long in New York City in the cold because it was the only thing I, I could do. I felt like I needed to do something if it even was just moving my legs. I didn't come back until 7 a.m. in the morning. And the, all, all the, the, pilot, uh, got, the pilots that were there to support us were in a panic because apparently they tried to come to my room and find me and I wasn't there. They had, the, they had the, the hotel open up the room and I was gone. They thought I'd run away. And we were there for about two days and then we had to conduct an interview with the National Transportation Safety Board who investigates these kind of accidents. At this point, of course, I hadn't slept. This is Saturday and I hadn't slept since Wednesday night. And I have a three hour uh, interview which is eight investigators around a conference table and me. And they just, they just ask you, they're polite about it, they're nice, but it's just question after question after question to get the details in the story uh, while it's still fresh in your mind. And, and I remember I was game to start with, but then I was just exhausted. And then one moment it was over. And w one of our guys popped me in a cab. We, the press was already there. They were outside the room. We had to go down a back elevator just to get out of the hotel and puts me in a cab with, uh, gives me 20 bucks for a $40 cab ride to LaGuardia. And, you know, I was, I was out of New York City. I didn't have much money with me. I didn't really carry much money when I went on trips and they didn't have credit card cabs at the time. So I had to stiff the cabbie a little bit on the tip, but I was broke. I didn't have even a dime to my name. And then I took a flight home to, uh, to uh, Madison, Wisconsin, where I live. So, you know, that's, that's, that's kind of a, that's the story of that day. But, you know, the broader message that I, I hope that you take away with you is that we, in fact, were very fortunate, um, not, not only because of the circumstances, but not only because of all of the, the, uh, the people that, that rose to the occasion that day, uh, our flight attendants, our air traffic controllers, uh, the first responders, you know, who came to both the, uh, not only out, you know, onto the, uh, uh, out to, to uh, rescue the people off the airplane, but also at the, at the, uh, the ferry dock, the boat crews, um, but also the many, many people that support um, modern airline flying by uh, constantly finding out what, what the mistakes are that we're making, developing procedures to solve them, and creating this, this, this immense uh, safety network or net that we have around us, both me as an airline pilot and you when you go flying every day. So that's, that's my story of the, the miracle on the Hudson. We probably have about 10 minutes for questions. Since, since the accident has occurred, uh, have there been safety measures put in place to not allow debris to enter through the engine compartments anymore? You know, usually I start out with the first question to give people uh, time to think, and that's my question. So thank you. Um, actually, uh, engines are giant air movement machines. Anything you put in front of them is going to stop that from happening. Uh, there really is 
there really isn't anything that we can do with modern technology to really uh, stop this accident from actually happening again, to be totally honest. We, uh, we can't really identify where birds are. They have radars that can kind of pick them up, but you don't know about the, the vertical elements. You can see them on a two-dimensional two screen, but you don't know what altitude they're at. So we really don't have any warning device for uh, flying into waterfowl. And anything that we would put in front of the engines would essentially uh, make them cease to work. So there, there really isn't anything that has changed uh, today over five years ago uh, as a result of this accident. But having said that, um, this was a very unusual circumstance. You know, we happened to hit a very large uh, flock of birds. Uh, airliners actually uh, regularly ingest birds. Maybe they'll have a lot of vibration. Maybe they even have to shut down an engine. Uh, but it's only one engine. And they come back and land. And you, you, you probably, it doesn't even make the news anymore. In fact, in the six months after this accident, there were seven or eight other airliners that had lost an engine because of bird ingestion. So it, in fact, happens. But what was extremely unusual with us was it was such a large flock, and we actually were unfortunate enough to lose both engines. Uh, and of course, we only had two. Hello. Oh, back here. Um, ever, ever since I saw the accident on the TV, I wanted to ask this question. Question is, you reckon you could do this again safely? And the reason I ask this is, on the newspapers back home in England, there were several things that were talking about pilots that had a go of this in the simulator and failed miserably to actually land the aircraft safely. Is this true? It, you know, I never really had any doubts myself. It's not, people, people ask you that, you know, did you see the light? Did you have your light flash before you got? No, no, none of that. I, I never had any doubts. I always thought that this was something that we were, you know, could do. And, uh, and, and in fact, it worked out. And we were fortunate. Um, and, you know, obviously, any kind of set of variables could make it different. But, uh, I mean, given the same circumstances, I don't see why we couldn't do it again. Just uh, two questions. Number one is, um, at the time when you struck the birds, were the, I'm, I'm not a pilot, I just fly RCs. Were the flaps down, and did you have the flaps down during the whole descent? When we, well, the question was, yeah. did we have the flaps uh, down when we hit the birds? No, because uh, we take off with some flaps down, but then we clean up so that the airplane can go faster. And we had, we had just done that, so we were at what we call a clean wing um, when we hit the birds. Now our minimum airspeed to fly at that airspeed, at, when that configuration is about 230 miles an hour. And uh, we lowered about half of the flaps coming down to land in the river because that significantly lowers our landing speed down to about 150. And that's about what we were doing when we actually touched down in the river. And the second question is, uh, I, I would probably think that I would try to land near the shoreline for quick access to uh, emergency, uh, you know, uh, boats, and uh, was that in the mind of, of Soli when he tried to land the, the aircraft? Uh, you know, the question was, do we land, do, do we try to land near the shore for uh, quick emergency access? I don't know that we were thinking that far ahead. <laughs> uh, it was sort of, we just were just landing straight ahead where we could find a flat, you know, uh, space. Do you know the story about the library book? The captain had a library book and he couldn't return the book. So the, the, the captain had a library book on the airplane, and he bu he lost the book, and he couldn't return the book. So the oh, that's that. Can you tell us your yeah, words? Maybe you know it. Yeah. In fact, yeah. So, Sully, of course, you know, he was like beyond being a hero, right? So he checked out a library book, and of course, it ended up being in the in his luggage. So it went down with the ship, so to speak. And uh, so he calls up his library and says that he's, they're not going to return the book. So this makes the national news, you know, that Sully's not returning that, that Sully's not returning his book. I had a library book too, and when I called up the library, they made me pay for it. <laughs> Do you know where you were, location-wise, in Manhattan or the Bronx or wherever when you had the bird strike? I don't know really exactly where it would be, you know, from your perspective up there. I'm not all that familiar with New York City. You had to go over the. The land, I mean, there's M Manhattan, and then there's the river. Right. And you, so you had to go wherever you struck the birds, 
come around to the river to go back to LaGuardia. Right. So right. you were going over that densely populated area to try to get to Teterboro, I guess, because it was... Right. Well, what happened was our air traffic controller actually gave us a heading. He told us to turn to 200 degrees. And it's at, as soon as we declared an emergency, and that's a standard procedure for them uh, because it because of their, uh, their air traffic flow. They have a lot of different air airports that are right there around there. And that turn actually brought us around and kind of lined us up with the western shore of Manhattan. And then we had to kind of go out and then uh, get to actually get into the center channel of the river. How difficult was it uh, from keeping the plane from stalling uh, in your turning? Um, well, it wasn't difficult to keep the airplane from stalling because um, you know, we, we fly, we actually have a, a, a speed called Green Dot, which is a, it's a little representation on our speed tape, which is uh, 1.3 times our stall speed. And that is, uh, and so Sully, when he took over, he pushed the nose down, accelerated to that Green Dot, and then just held a pitch angle that would maintain that speed all the way down. Because that would give us not only safe speed, but also uh, our uh, greatest uh, ability to uh, extend our glide. I think we got time for one more question. Okay, when um, just before you guys had impact, you were um, coming down. You were able to flare the aircraft, and then when when you came into the river, what effect did the two engines hanging under the wing have when you guys impacted? The question was what effect did the engines have, and I don't really recall anything. Um, when you actually watch that little videotape, it veers to the left, but that's because that engine is the one that actually came off the airplane and, and went to the bottom of the uh, bottom of the river. Um, but I don't really recall it having any kind of effect that was noticeable for us uh, when we did, in fact, touch down. They, uh, that river, the river's about 90 feet deep there. And the engine, of course, goes right to the bottom and they have to recover it. So they use, uh, you know, things that you see on the Discovery Channel, side-looking sonar, whatever that is, I don't know, it sounds good. You know, to locate the engine, and then you figure they'd use some sort of like highly precise, you know, uh, GPS device to locate it. But, you know, it's New York City, so they drop a 1,200-pound concrete block on it with a buoy attached, and they bullseye the engine because the cowling came floating to the surface, you know, after they dropped, the, uh, dropped it on there. Well, thank you very much for coming. Thank you for listening to my story. Thank you very much, Jeff.